I've got a large collection of arcade games. I wonder how much it would cost to complete all of them if it was a real arcade. Only one way to find out. For you 90s kids, those few notes have just hit you right in the childhood. The X-Men are one of Marvel's most famous teams and were one of the creations that spearheaded Marvel's evolution out of comics and onto the silver screen, animation and video games. Unfortunately, just like biological evolution, it wasn't perfect. Mistakes were made and not every attempt landed well with the audiences. The movie started strong but gradually got worse, with any that featured Wolverine scoring better. The cartoons, most from the 90s and early 2000s, were better received and still hold up to this day. The video games? Well, there's a lot of misses there, but they weren't all complete failures, and some of them are pretty decent. Funnily enough, one of the best games is based on the best cartoon, simply named X-Men. It's a 2D beat-em-up for one to six players. There were other versions that you could find that went up to two, or four at most. The cabinet for six players was huge and didn't fit in a lot of arcades, but it was a fucking good time if you could find one, and with Konami involved, that just reassured you even more. The game, in a sense, starts with the attraction sequence. On Asteroid M, Magneto and his posse are doing a blue screen photo shoot and Wolverine and his hairy bear arms sense that something's up. So they take the X-Jet to stop whatever plan they may have. Once you insert your first credit, you're given the choice of six X-Men. Nothing indicates any form of stats or abilities, they all feel the same to play for the most part. The only real difference is their look, animations and super attack. Naturally, Akka chose the sweet boy Nightcrawler and I chose psychotic feral killing machine Hugh Jackman. With selections made, the first cutscene plays and I would let the narrator fill you in but guess what I forgot to do again. So Selenik's coming to save the day on this one. In the 21st century, evil mutants led by Magneto aim to destroy the world. Humans can do nothing against the power of the evil mutant. The only hope is the X-Men. Go and save the city. No need for a tutorial because the controls are super simplistic and intuitive. The game features 8-way movement, a jump button, an attack button and a super attack button. The game has no pickups but we will get to how you do your super attacks in a moment. Each player has a small info panel which is a little confusing if you just look at it. Take a look at it and take a guess, what represents your life? Obviously those of you who have played this before already know but if you guess this number, no. Dumbass, what the fuck's wrong with you? It's obviously this bar, never mind that the number says life next to it just to confuse you. The coloured bar is your life, the life counter is your remaining credits. These spirit bombs are mutant powers, but using them has an arse backward mechanic. Using an ultimate power drains three bars of your life until it is a maximum of three. Then you can use the orbs for the power attack. Why though? Why should I have to put myself in near death to use ultimate moves for free? Chances are I'll be dead before I even get to use them all. And when I die, yeah, I get an orb back, but I'll still have to be near death before I can use it and there's no items to pick up, so it's not like I can heal the damage I'm doing to myself in order to use my free ultimate attacks. So in short, WHAT'S THE FUCKING POINT?! The goal of each level is what you would expect in a brawler beat em up. Move to the side, fight enemies, rinse repeat, until you reach the boss and engage in a spandex fight to the death. Levels are also very short but stuffed with action. While it looks kind of chaotic, and it is, the combat is easy to follow. Enemies die easy but they aren't a pushover. Sometimes they can be cheap and one frame attack you. But for the most part the strength comes from their numbers and can potentially overwhelm a small team of players if they aren't careful. Thankfully though, your moveset is capable of hitting multiple enemies at once, throwing them into each other, and as Hugh Jackman, you can repeatedly stab people in the dick. Is dick abuse going to be a new habit for me? What's 
the hell is wrong with you? Bosses, on the other hand, are slightly tougher, but can potentially feel one-sided the more human players... or mutant players... are involved. The first boss you fight is Pyro. He's an easy boss, but dying to him is still possible because he has increased damage. He's more agile than any enemy you've encountered in this level, and his hit detection is sometimes turned off so he can get away from you. Nothing massively cheap though, and it's a decent fair-ish fight. He only has two attacks, I think. One straight flamethrower attack, and the second we didn't get to see because Akka kept punching him in his oversized bulge when he tried to do it. When a boss is approaching death, they begin to flash pink and blue, with an increased attack rate. In Pyro's case though, he dies in about 10 hits as soon as he begins to strobe light, and lets out his mighty death scream. At the end of the level, you're given a free mutant orb. Gee thanks, I can't wait to self-harm enough to use it, but at least I don't lose it on death. Level 2! At first it will feel like a reskin of the first level. The same enemies, only a corridor, not a street. Quickly though, you'll see that the levels vary in structure as well as look, and each level will feature at least one new foe and definitely palette swaps of already existing enemies. This level debuts the new Microsoft Laser Computer. Palette swapped enemies normally don't have any stat changes, but Bill Gates' killing machine comes in yellow, which is stuck on the rails, and greenish grey that can move around freely. These are probably the models that search for his next wife. What also stands out about this level is that they ignore traditional rules for beat-em-ups, and you have to sometimes walk backwards to advance further. Other small but neat features like self-opening blast doors and lifts, along with evolving animated backgrounds, give life to the levels, and effectively break the mould of 2D levels in brawler games. Not only does it break the mould, it lets you break the blob. Blob is, in all honesty, a funny boss to fight. He's got a bit more health than Pyro though, only he's the tiniest bit harder. He can only attack by melee and throwing players around. As you expect, he's just a tub of meat and you need to hit him until he dies. But what makes it funny is when you hit him enough and knock him down, and he sits there like a child in time out, and then you just slap him some more. Like Pyro though, the fact he will interrupt attacks regardless how many times you're giving him a pink belly, you will lose a few lives because of this. He's fairly easy to beat regardless though. If you're lucky, you get to see him be a dumbass and somehow throw a player into himself. Level 3, Professor X sporting a Raver's mini afro, tells you that Magneto has taken him and Kitty Pry to Island M, so you need to head there for a nice walkabout in the jungle. And again, you start off fighting sentinels and gun units. What the hell is that? It's a literal scaly. Wait a minute. Island M. M could stand for Moreau, the godfather of all furries. And he did have his own island, so... Are we secretly in the Isle of Dr. Monroe? Oh. The freaky enemies don't end with the yellow crocodudes. Fighting through the jungle, you'll also encounter killer hornets, mud monsters, and pointlessly gendered plants. Why is there lipstick on these things? The enemy variety is considerably large throughout the game. It's a guarantee you're going to be fighting sentinel units on every level, and they'll be huge on varying colours, but little in varying capabilities. A few of the other enemies do get reused, but the majority of non-sentinel enemies on the roster are unique to that level. When it comes to overall capabilities, most enemies behave and attack very similarly. None of the standard enemies try to charge you, or restrain you, or carry you off, or anything special like that. Just shooting and punching that's been animated differently, but do the same damage and give the illusion of variety. But I know your tricks, Konami. Though this isn't the worst thing you've done in a game. Another thing that makes this particular level stand out is that this is the one where this iconic line comes from. Shortly after this moment, you have to fight the boss of the level, Wendigo. And I think he's been watching too much Pokemon because he just shouts his name constantly. Wendigo, use Claw Slash! As a boss, 
I genuinely think he's bugged. Hitting him can be a difficult task because of what feels like shoddy hit detection, which often results in you being hit by him and you can't hit back. Aside from that, he is pretty underwhelming. The occasional strike and grab attacks make it feel like you're fighting the blob again, and with so little health, two people pounding him will just kill him in over 30 seconds. Level 4. Entering the cave where Wendigo came out of, you fight your way through sentinels and gunners. To start, it looks like there isn't anything new to fight here. The Crocker Dudes and the Mud Men make a return with new colours, as do the Sentinels and the Gunmen, when suddenly Discount Laserbeak comes in, rapidly giving birth to overwhelm you with their numbers. Sound familiar? Yep. Just like the Killer Hornets. This is easily the weakest level of the game. Mostly recycled elements and a bare basics level design certainly hurts the game's playability here. It puts the idea into your head that this is now how the rest of the game will be. Even the end level boss feels like a cut and paste of Blob again, only with a different look. I didn't even know who this was supposed to be at first, but apparently this is supposed to be Nimrod. A sentinel that's able to learn from encounters and not be defeated in the same way twice. Yet again though, it feels like a copy and paste of Blob. A punching attack, a grabbing attack, lowish health. He does have one unique attack though, and that's where he shoots a laser that explodes, of which you can't avoid unless you are already walking away from him. This boss, combined with the last boss, and this level in particular, make the game start to feel stale. I can't think of a better word for it, but I can summarise it in one sound. At this point in the game, you might start to feel... If I can say one thing about this boss though on a more positive note, it's that he has a gruesome death. Woof, I saw his spine. That's gross. On Nimrod's death, we rescue Kitty Pride and she tells us to rescue the Professor as we all watch in awe at that weird thing she's doing with her lip. Then on to level 5. The game starts to pick back up here again. There are environmental or hidden traps that will take you by surprise. The visuals start to be animated and more detailed again. The level gimmicks go beyond a simple lift, and a lightning storm in the background nicely sets an atmosphere during some of the fights. A giant sentinel vomits out enemies at you, and you get not one, but two whole bosses. Before any of that though, let's talk about the graphics. The character sprites are really well done. The animations flow efficiently and you can see the wind up of attacks. The comic book look has been expertly achieved and every character, both playable and NPC, look exactly like they should. Well, almost. Backgrounds are a mixed bag. The outside environments look really nice with the amount of shading and detail that goes into them, while the inside environments, while still looking nice-ish, lack as much detail. I get that in a lab or a factory, it's not meant to look pretty, it's just meant to work, but compare these two shots together, which one looks like it had more work done on it? That's not all to say that all the indoor environments are shit. You'll see in the next level one that actually looks pretty good, but the outside ones clearly have superior quality. The cutscenes, as you would expect for a game of this era, have good graphics but lack animation. Static images with very little movement or movement made of a few frames make up the sequences, but there are the occasional moment where they don't look right at all. Two examples are Magneto's awkward smile, and what the hell is wrong with Wolverine's arm here? It's like his whole bicep has been removed. If I just channel an internet douchebag artist for a few seconds... Hashtag fixed it! 
first boss you encounter in this level is Emma Frost, easily the weakest and most disappointing boss in the game. Just watch the whole fight. She died faster than Nimrod did. Not only that, but she also had very little in attacks, using only a yellow stick in the occasional hit. Emma can turn into a highly durable diamond and is a telekinetic, and yet she used none of those powers in this fight. If anything, she came across as an overly confident cosplayer who got drunk and started looking for a fight. The second boss is Vinnie Jones. The juggernaut, bitch! At least here they put a little bit of effort in. Juggernaut is a powerhouse of muscle, and they could have made it so that he was yet another blob clone. Instead, they decided to make him stand out with a gun. You know, that signature cannon that he carries around with him in all the comics? That one? Like the rest of the bosses, except Pyro and Blob, he is lacklustre. He only has two attacks, which are gun and charge. Nothing characteristic like ground pounds or slowly charge haymakers. At least he actually takes a fair amount of a beating like his character actually would. And his helmet fell off at one point. Which is only good if you had a psychic character, of which there are none. Defeating Juggernaut makes Professor X appear and says a humorous but not as iconic line. X-Men, nice job. Magneto is over there. Follow me. Okay, we will follow over there. Surprise, surprise though. It's Mystique, and she lured you into a trap underneath the temple, which becomes level 6. I personally like the music in this one. I think the best way I could summarise the music is... Saturday morning soundtrack. If you listen to some of these tracks, you can picture them in your head having a place in the old 90s Saturday morning cartoons. In all honesty, have a listen and let me know if you agree in the comments. For the most part, the music fits the levels. The very first level has a heroic tone to it. They are the temple level has a creepy supernatural essence to it. And the boss music has a clear indication of, oh shit, it's battle time! But not even the music can help out that one level with that one boss and those enemies. <laughs> The level starts out strong with its numerous traps and hazards, but quickly becomes a standard slugfest with a lot of recycled enemies. But you will get attacked by four pink pyros for some reason. Call me a dick if you want, but when they all entered the screen like that, all I could hear in my head was... <laughs> they behave just like the pyro boss at the start of the game, but are notably weaker in health. Killing the Ginyu Force fanboys allows you to move on to the actual boss, and once again, there's multiple. The first boss, or rather bosses, are two no-name pharaoh statues that come alive. They are, say it with me now, lack luster. They're not too bad to fight, they have one attack combo but they abuse the one frame attacks a bunch. Killing them awakens the third statue. And apparently, this guy actually has a name and it's meant to be Living Monolith. I can see the resemblance. Not only does he look like a Jojo reject, but he can shoot a laser out of his gem. Ooh. Ultimately, he's just like the first two, but with an extra attack, and what felt like the same amount of health. It's at this point I can say with ease that the majority of the bosses are one of the biggest flaws of this game. Pyro and Blob have been the best so far. Pyro was good because he was a boss that used fire blasts and bounced around. He acted like his character. 
Blob was a good boss because he was a big slow idiot and had a vulnerable state. He acted like his character. The rest, however, felt like toughened up grunt enemies with only their look and voice reflecting the character. Bear in mind though, we still have Mystique and Magneto to beat yet. Perhaps they can break this mould of Blob bosses. Professor X stuns the White Raver Afro again to inform us that he's being held on Asteroid M. You chase down the fleeing Sentinel to get there, and it's on to the final level. Oh, good thing there's air in space or that could have gotten very messy. As it's the last level, you can expect the gauntlet trope to come into play. All the enemies and bosses you've encountered up until this point are waiting for you here, and you might also expect that the bosses have also been made weaker and attack you in teams. What you might not expect is that while fighting the weakened bosses Nimrod and Vinnie Jones, Magneto, an actual boss, could interfere with that fight if you go too far to the right. Which is a bit of a pain, but it's not the worst thing. Now that Magneto has made his debut, will he be a shooting star and break the mould? No! Despite being the master of magnetism, he acts uncharacteristic. No magnet powers of any kind, just punches and thick thigh attacks. You know how this dance goes by now. Except... Our Magneto is in another room. Mystique was the uncharacteristic boss the whole time. I joke, but wouldn't it have been cool if she actually took the form of some of the player characters during the fight? With Professor X saved, he instructs us to go after Magneto. The other room, we- HOLY SHIT! Well, that's a hell of an entrance. Right off the bat, Magneto is acting like his character. He has four attacks, the punch and the thick fire attacks return, but he also has a ranged attack, and uh... He's also cheap as fuck. His one frame attack rate is abuse to shit, and still being able to shoot you while moving slowly in his... SHIELD! is just douchey. He also constantly interrupts your attacks, and trying to combo him can be a pain in the ass. On the other hand, he does take a hell of a beating and he even has two stages of flashing. He just suffers from the trope of, I'm the final boss, so I'm a dick and I'm gonna milk all the money out of your wallet. Gotta think of a shorter name for that. Make sure you save your money for this bit, cause you're gonna need it. After a longer and tough battle, you finally defeat Magneto, and then the final cutscene plays. Asteroid M blows up. And I think we left Magneto on there. Credits roll while constantly reminding you that the game's not over yet. But really it is. All that happens is that the X-Jet flies back to Earth and the game starts again. X-Men Arcade is a good time and I would defo recommend it. So long as you have at least two players, as the multiplayer is one of the biggest selling points and best part of this game. Absolutely, if you can, get five other friends and play the six player version. Being able to move as a squad and destroy everything in your way feels great, and the gameplay is fair and balanced bar a few notable exceptions, and the controls are responsive and read well. The graphics make every action you take feel impactful, and overall is a pleasure to look at. It has got some flaws in both presentation and gameplay, which does hurt the experience a bit, but not enough to put you off it. Despite the flaws, much enjoyment is to be had here, and it still holds up to today's standards. So give it a go if you can, just bring a lot of money because death will come easy. Speaking of money, let's tally up the credits. So with two credits for two players to start the game at 50p each, meant it cost £1 to start a two player game. A total of 76 deaths between us at 50p each results in 76 credits and £36 spent to complete X-Men, overtaking Metal Slug X and just £1 behind House of the Dead 2. And bringing our grand totals to 853 credits spent and £700.50 total money. And that was X-Men the Arcade Game. Thanks for watching everyone. Join me next time where we'll be taking a stroll down Midway Memory Lane.